And that's as political as James Marsh is going to get on Deep Dive Movie Reviews. <laughs> on the show. show. On the show. You're wonderful to see. You ought to be in pictures all. Oh, what a hit. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. My name is James, joined as ever by my friend Steve. And on this Easter weekend, a very special episode talking Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Hey, but you know how this is done. If you haven't already subscribed, it'd be a great favor to us. And just as a reminder, we do do spoilers here, but Passion of the Christ has been out for 20 years, I think. And we think we know he Don't lives tell me how it ends. Don't right? tell he me lives, how it ends. He comes back, right? Ah, uh, spoilers. Oh. Um, so, yeah, this was your request, Steve. So why don't you tee this one up? Yeah, this is the Mel Gibson film that he did in 2004, which kind of broke all kinds of records for the, I think it was the highest grossing R-rated movies of all time, if if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, James. I think it was up until uh, I want to say like The Hangover or Deadpool or something like that. Right, but I think, it, right. I believe it still holds the record as yeah. the most successful, almost profitable independent movie of all time. Yes. And of course, it follows the gospel accounts of the passion, the crucifixion and ultimate resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hugely controversial film because of the the violence involved. I think we've been used to over over the decades of films and plays of Jesus with a much more subtle crucifixion, a much less violent, uh, you know, expression of of the crucifixion. And Mel Gibson gives us really just 110% of what the Romans would have enacted on a political prisoner. Absolutely. I mean, the the irony is that it kind of came out right at the same time that um, there was these kind of sort of very violent, gory um, sort of torture porn horror movies were coming out of France and coming out of the U S at the same time. And that was the state of the horror genre at the time. So then, you know, supposedly completely unrelated, Mel Gibson comes out with his <clears throat> his passion project, quite literally, yeah. and and you're like, whoa, you know, it's it's every bit as violent as like Hostel or um, Inside or Martyrs, you know, these uh, these French horror movies that are coming out, and you're like, what what is going on? And I think it took um, it kind of blindsided the evangelists a little bit, didn't it? I, it absolutely did. I mean, obviously, they had huge evangelical support. I mean, back in those days, 2004, I was still kind of in the mainstream of evangelicalism. And so we were all really excited when this film came out. This was kind of our banner film, and we went as a group to go see it. And I mean, having rewatched it again last night, I rewatched it with my 12-year-old son. My my wife was a little hesitant on that. She wasn't sure a 12 year old should be watching it i did cover his eyes or make him turn away at a few key moments or or i sped up a couple key moments that i thought might have been over the top for him but you know to see a 12 year old with tears coming down his face and even i was getting misty eyed this is a james this is a powerful film whether you're a person of faith a christian or not uh, it's hard to watch this film and not be emotionally moved Oh, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Whether you um, recognize the character as the son of God or or yes. not, um, it's about a man who is being sort of, you know, arrested and tried and, and convicted and executed for, you know, crimes he didn't commit, if you like, you right. know, so for perce- yeah. as a perceived danger to the establishment and mm-hmm. is quite literally, you know, put through the ringer by mm-hmm. other interested parties. You know what's interesting? I can cut this part out, James, if if we think that it's a little too political. <clears throat> but this is happening right at the time that we're seeing Donald Trump being indicted. And I'm watching some of these Republican evangelicals uh, compare Trump's uh, what he's experiencing to Jesus Christ. When I just when President I saw President Trump that- is joining some of the most incredible people in history being arrested today. Um, Nelson Mandela was arrested, served time in prison. Jesus, Jesus was arrested and murdered by uh, the Roman government. When I just, when I saw that, Mm. I I kind of, and and the comparisons, you have the son of God, whether you believe that or not, I do, uh, Jesus Christ, who is just full of compassion, of kindness, of healing the sick, giving dignity to the marginalized, constantly uh, affirming people. And then that's the reason he's being tortured and crucified. And when he has a chance to defend himself, 
he doesn't. He doesn't defend himself. And he never encourages his followers to rise up, to protest, to do anything that would undermine the message of love and compassion, as opposed to the evangelicals who were came out for this movie so much 20 years ago. And, you know, still to this day, there's a huge following of them for Trump, whereas Trump's out there going, you know, protest, rise up. You know, he's attacking all of his acute is just the complete opposite. So for me, watching this film, there, there was an, a measure of watching where I've come in my own faith from 2004 to now. And I've shed so much of that, the political nonsense, the core of what I believe is really perfectly encapsulated into this in this film. This is a person who is willing to die rather than to raise up arms of violence against anyone. Yeah, not only that, but throughout the process, he's asking God to forgive the, his yes. persecutors and his torturers yes. all the way through. You know, So it couldn't be more opposite. And yeah, I saw Marjorie Taylor Greene comparing Trump to Nelson Mandela <laughs> and Jesus the other day. It's oh, like, shut up, it, shut up, yeah. you stupid, crazy woman. Sorry, yeah, you, you, she yeah. has no idea what she's talking about. <clears throat> none, none. Now, and you, you bring up a really key point, that whole moment of Jesus, you know, in the midst, and rather than looking down and saying, you know, fuck you to everybody who, you know, I've just spent the last years loving people, healing people, feeding people, affirming people, and this is what you do to me. And instead of doing that, you know, he forgives. And uh, yeah, it was in that moment that I got a little misty eyed because it just sets such an example for what the human race is supposed to be. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so it is, it's a very sort of interesting and, um, dare I say, kind of confrontational, perhaps even exploitative uh, mm -hmm. portrayal of this story, a story that we have, we, we, that a lot of people will know, obviously, um, and that we have seen depicted on screen before numerous times. And what he's done here is he focuses solely on the sort of the last 12 hours uh the the passion if you like you yeah. know just those those sort of final steps those final moments um but he does so in a way that is wholly cinematic and wholly mm. sort of contemporary in many ways in the way that is approached in terms of the yes the levels of violence uh the performance style um the use of cgi um mm. but i think it's within those moments where he also uh pushes should we say the 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 limits or expectations of certain audience members as well because he goes right out on a limb with some of the the imagery in terms of um you know sort of the the, the devil the the demonic um taunting that that jesus uh undergoes during those those final hours um he has visions of a kind of a, a cloaked hooded bald pale yeah. um you know figure you know not wholly dissimilar to you know sort of the albino monk from the da vinci code or right. um william sadler's version of death from bill and ted's bogus journey you know you know it, or, which obviously is in and of itself a reference to the seventh seal um you know, and there's something in, and, and the, the character even carries around this sort of demon baby at one point, you, yeah, you know, and yeah. there are scenes on the top of, of mountains sw with swirling sort of CG hellscapes for one of another. Mm -hmm. And this coming hot on the heels of like the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I remember yeah. when I saw this movie, there were so many sort of quote unquote contemporary cinematic tools and references going on. You know, you're in many ways you're not quite sure how to how to take this version of the story. I was just unclear exactly at times. You know, really, what does he want? What does he want us to see here? What does he want us to yeah. take, or what's he going for that hasn't been represented before? Yeah. Well, I think what it is is he, for the first time he gave us a very unsanitized crucifixion. Most sure. crucifixions that we've seen, even on film let alone in a church passion play. We'll have some Swedish actor with blonde hair and a bath towel, you know, who's really good looking. And uh, obviously Jim Caviezel is a, a good looking guy. But the idea of the crucifixion, the crucifixion was one of the worst forms of execution known to mankind. I mean, this was designed to make an example of you. I mean, and even Mel Gibson 
would still put a loincloth on Caviezel, whereas mm. they were always paraded around and, and executed naked. I mean, there was every every ounce of dignity is stripped away from these prisoners, and they're nailed to a, a tree, and they're put on display as an example to anybody else that thinks about challenging the Roman Empire. And it was pretty effective. And uh, But I think, you know, viscerally, I think most people, let alone Christians, are not prepared to really uh, encounter the reality of what a crucifixion was. Mm -hmm. and, and Gibson would say, I'm going to show you what a crucifixion was really like. Now, did he take liberties? I mean, we we don't know. And there's been a lot of accusation, a lot of controversy that there's excessive violence or there's a lot of things that were shown that maybe went up and over the top. But, you know, I had somebody on a, my podcast about a year ago on trauma therapy and saying that, suggesting that a lot of political prisoners were crucified in that kind of situation being naked would be sexually assaulted as well. It's not, on, although we have no recur, recur, recorded account of any sexual abuse. Yeah, it's not beyond the, the the realm of possibility that Jesus could have been sexually assaulted. Obviously, Gibson didn't go there. So, I, you know, I don't have any problems with the level of violence because I think it, it's, it's creating an authentic experience of what Jesus would have really encountered. Does everybody need to see it? And does it need to come with warnings and all kinds of disclaimers about the level of violence? Absolutely. But um, as a viewer, to me, I appreciated having that experience. Well, this is the thing. I mean, this is one of the, the great sort of hypocrisies, if you like, I'm going to choose my words carefully, but sort of hypocrisies of Christianity is that the crucifixion itself and the, the cross has become sort of emblematic or the, the logo, mm -hmm. if you like, for the right. entire religion and the belief system. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, you know, it's it's this incredibly sanitized version of the image. Yeah. You know, often Jesus isn't even on it. It's it's simply a yeah, cross, you know, yeah. something that you might wear made of silver around your neck, for example, right. to signify exactly that same thing might not even have a body on it at all. You know, it, and that's because and that's for uh, decorum's sake, you know, and, and, yeah, and yeah. you know, and it's for, you know, being in good taste. And I think that there has been sort of a danger over the last sort of 2000 years or whatever um, to forget quite how horrific a scene that was. Yeah. You know, and, you know, it's 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 everything that you just said. It is absolutely horrific. Uh, yeah. We may even today, even in Mel Gibson's version, skirt around you know the excesses of how to, just how torturous and um assaultive it it was um and for 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 kind of like the hard hardline christians who are like you know i'm i'm so invested in this that i'm offend, i'm offended yeah. by the reality of what it is makes makes no sense to me um do, you know does the, but the, the, then as you have to sort of say what are what are mel gibson's motivations for this is he mm -hmm. showing us you know this is this is the suffering you know th this is what what jesus went through or is he trying to, for something a little bit more um sensationalist you know who can say what's going on in his head i saw enough interviews with him on this subject over the years where I think this is a guy who a very flawed guy with a very genuine faith, you know, and, mm. and he's also a great filmmaker. I mean, he is, I think we just had Alan Unger on our show recently, director of the film bandit. And he even mentioned having Mel Gibson in the, in his movie, the guy's never made a bad film. Like there's no film that you look at that he's made that you think as a director oh that's a bad yeah, as a director yes <laughs> yeah. sorry sorry as a director he's, he's been in some yeah. not great movies but yeah. Uh, yeah 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 sorry but i was thinking yes directing you know you got you got braveheart you got apocalypto you've got the passion of the christ you've got mm. uh hacksaw ridge you know and these the, are the man without films. a face even his first movie yeah it's not bad at yeah all. yeah so um so i think it's a combination of someone who really wanted to have a great cinematic movie going experience and also a very visceral representation of what Jesus endured on the cross. Sure, sure. I mean, the one thing we haven't mentioned, uh, which is arguably sort of one of the biggest stumbling blocks about the film, certainly when it was trying to get funding, is is that is the language. It's not in English. Yes. 
Um, he defiantly, when he put this project together, uh, he de- he was defiant about, no, I want it to be as quote unquote authentic as possible. And so I'm going to use, it's going to be in Latin and Hebrew and this sort of reconstructed form Aramaic. of Aramaic, it's, which is yeah. this dead language um, that Jesus and, the, and those around him would speak. Uh, and originally his plan was he didn't even want it to be subtitled. Right. He wanted. He just yeah. wanted it to play like that. He was like, everybody who's going to watch this movie knows this story anyway, and I think it's going to be powerful enough. And I think that part of his um, vision for this movie is that he, the visuals are going to speak for themselves. Yeah. And yeah. I think I think there is some justification for that. I think he is not wrong, but it's for that reason primarily that no studio in Hollywood wanted to touch it with a barge pole. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and ultimately he had to fund it with his own money. It cost about $30 million to, 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 to produce and release. I think he shot it in Italy. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then it goes on, you know, and everyone thought this is going to be an absolute disaster. You know, they thought it was going to ruin the career. Of, well, We'll get on to that. Did it ruin the career of Jim Caviezel or not? Um, you know, who was this kind of hot new property, up and coming star? You know, it's got Monica Bellucci in it. You know, should is it is it a poison chalice? Forgive the yeah. Christian pun. Um, you know, and then it turns out to be an absolute behemoth. You know, yeah. and it's made. I think last time I checked, it made over six hundred million dollars worldwide yeah. off a budget of thirty million dollars. So you do the maths: two thousand percent profit or something like that you know so it's absolute it's absolutely crazy uh and that is despite the fact that yeah it got a hard r rating for for its violent content and and yet you know it it, it, it attracted uh audiences i mean I, I do know that a couple of years later he did go back and re-edit it mm-hmm. you know not not to, not george lucas style but he did say okay because he had he had listened to his congregation, and they had said you know we love the film we want to take our family as you just said you know you you, you sat down with your twelve year old to watch it yesterday, and they said the one thing that's holding us back you know we want to share this story, but the one thing that's holding us back is is the visceral levels of violence which again plays into this great sort of <laughs> hypocrisy I was I was pointing out earlier, um, but he conceded he was like okay okay fine. And yeah. so he trimmed about five minutes out of it and the sort of the passion redux or whatever it was called um, was re-released a couple of years later. And I think that uh, that was by and large sort of even even better received by yeah. those certain audiences. Well, you know, evangelicals have never had a problem with violence. Conservatives and violence go together like, you know, peanut butter. Like and the jelly. Crusades. Yeah, yeah I was, was going <laughs> to say is that... Uh, um there's there's no sex in this film see evangelicals they get really wary of sex i still remember being at a film festival once with william h macy and he's talking about the difference between conservatives and liberals when it comes to film going he says you know in in the movie the cooler that he was uh speaking on he had just been at that was being presented at this particular film festival he says you know we have uh alec baldwin like busting the kneecap of somebody you know in the film and the censors don't have a problem with that. But what we what came back to us from the censors was you can't show Mario uh, Maria Bello's pubic hair. He says, and this is the the problem. He says liberals struggle with the the violence, um, but they have no problem with the sex. The conservatives they really they have no problem with the violence, but you can't show a pubic hair. You know, it's like you can bust somebody's kneecap, but pubic hair is out. And uh, it's, so it's just interesting. After I heard that, and then in subsequent years, analyzing through that filter, and this was geared, Passion of the Christ was geared for evangelicals. So violence was never a big issue with that. Well, yeah, I mean, and not to get into it too much, but you know, you only need to look at the at what's happening in schools in the U.S. right now um, to know that they're far more comfortable. I'm going to say this as bluntly as well. They're far more comfortable with school shootings than they are with gender neutral bathrooms. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. But it, it tells you everything, I think. And it's, it's absolutely horrifying. And that's as political as James Marsh is going to get on deep dive movie reviews <laughs> on the show. Sure. <laughs> on the show. I do. I just have to give the anecdote. James is that uh, Tammy was asking Ethan how she enjoyed or how he enjoyed watching the passion of the Christ and was kind of trying to gauge whether it was too much for him. 
And he was saying, oh, I was, it was really emotional. And, and she goes, well, of course it was emotional. And, 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 but he interjects, he goes, but it's okay because Jesus comes back. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. He, he, he knows the ending. It's like, it's okay. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, just to, just to go back to what I was alluding to earlier, that um, Jim Caviezel, mm-hmm. who plays obviously Jesus in this movie, you know, before, he was he was one of the hottest new actors in Hollywood. You know, he'd had a pivotal mm-hmm. role in The Thin Red Line, Terrence Malick's big World War II movie, which famously, yeah. you know, has so many actors in it. And during filming, nobody knew who the lead character was. And everybody mm-hmm. kind of was being told by Malick, oh, this is going to be your movie. And then he just <clears throat> worked it all out in the edit. And some actors didn't even end up in the final cut. But Jim Caviezel ended up surfacing as one of the main characters. Uh, and that sort of really put him on a path. And then he showed up in things like Frequency and uh, Count of Monte Cristo. And um, you were like, okay, you know, he's he's shaping up to be a big new star. And then he does this. And coincidence or no coincidence, after this, his he kind of, I mean, he stays working. Yeah. But the quality yeah. of role he is given after this sort of evaporates. Mm-hmm. And yeah. become sort of very, very, very different, you know. So yeah. even though the movie was a huge success, it w- it was also like, you know, where do you go after playing after playing Jesus? Kind of thing. <laughs> you know, conspiracy theorists will have all kinds of opinions on you know persecution or bias within liberal Hollywood towards a more conservative figure. I mean, Caviezel has come out and said some some rather conservative leaning things which Mm -hmm. probably didn't sit well with a lot of people within established hollywood but like you said he's kept working for years he was on person of interest which is a was a highly acclaimed tv show which he was on for years and i i know many actors that would love to be on a hit tv series for a number of years but like you said he he was he was on the trajectory for a-list cinema and that seems to, at least by the casual observer, to have gotten derailed. Uh, yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, but then we also we also need to sort of talk about Mel Gibson himself, really. Uh, you know, he, this was the first film he had directed since winning the Oscar for Braveheart almost a decade earlier. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think he had been trying to get this movie made for, for that long. You know, obviously... Yeah you know, a continuing work as an actor and doing and doing well with that. You know, it, it is kind of interesting see, watching this film and then seeing how his career kind of stumbled later after mm-hmm. sort of drunken public outbursts of one yeah. kind or another yeah. uh, over the ensuing years. Because one of the criticisms of this movie is not its violence, um, but is its kind of anti-Semitism. Yeah. The fact that it leans hard into the notion that the Jew, the Jews killed Jesus. Yeah. I've always struggled with that as somebody who reads the gospels. I mean, to me, that's what occurred. And I, I've never picked up the anti-Semitic. It, to me, it's anti-religious leader, political leader type. But to me, everybody barring Pontius Pilate, everybody in this film is Jewish. So it can't be anti-Semitic. His mother is Jewish. Mary Magdalene is Jewish. All the disciples are Jewish. You know, this is this is not a anti-Semitic, like there's there's like these Gentiles, like Jesus is a Gentile and all of his followers are Gentiles and these Jews are persecuting him. No, this was, this was you know, uh, their religious establishment didn't like a usurper. Well, they didn't like yeah, somebody. He, he threatened, and, and, and he threatened, he threatened, the threatened the system. their position. You know, he threatened the position of influence, he, 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 of, of wealth yeah. and power. Yeah, He flipped over the tables and they didn't like it. And it finally reached a crescendo to the point where they uh, execute him. And the reason they had to go to the, the Romans is they were a colonized people. It was the, I mean, it was essentially the, the British in Hong Kong. You know, you, you, they couldn't just do it locally. They had mm. to go to the, the governor and Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor. So yeah, I've always struggled with the anti-Semitic um, accusations. I, I don't really buy it. Well, I think, I think I see I see the criticisms in the film. I, I what I what I'm not willing to back is um is is the no, is, is is what the film is saying is that that you know it was the high, the high priest who were really you know strong arming Pilate essentially mm-hmm. to to yeah. crucify him rather than let him go. You know, there's more than one occasion yeah. where Pilate's like, hey, you know, yeah, 
you know, I'll, I'll flog him and let him go. No, 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 no. He must be crucified. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do it a bit more and then yeah. go, no, 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 no. Um, yeah. But it's, it's the degree with which the film yeah. sort of zeroes in on these high priests. And well, goes, it's not helped in later years that Mel Gibson actually oh, no, this is goes on anti-Semitic. If Mel Gibson had never gone on a tirade that was anti-Semitic, this wouldn't be as big an issue as it is, but it makes us in retrospect go back to his works and re-examine them in that in that light. And it 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 doesn't look it doesn't look favorable. No, well, I think there was com- contemporaneous criticism of the film I, no, for that. To, to be sure, but I don't think uh, yeah, I totally agree. But like I, I, I mentioned in hindsight, looking back now. Now, even myself, who would have defended as being not anti-Semitic, because I find it very based on the scriptures that were written by Jews. You know, they're written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you could see where Pontius Pilate in the Gospels is trying to just let him go. He thought if uh, if finally he just, if I just beat him, beat him Mm -hmm. bad, then I can, they'll they'll be, you know, satiated and we can just move on. And so the, those things are all chronicled. So Mel Gibson doing the actual gospel narrative shouldn't be viewed as being anti-Semitic. But now looking back, you think, well, how much did he lean into it as opposed to maybe curbing some of the rougher edges? Right. Well, that's it. I mean, because we've seen this story, like I said, told many times, and it is certainly sort of underscored again and again and again in this movie and in, in where whereas it isn't so much yeah in yeah. uh in other adaptations i mean and that's i think where i come down on the film at the in the end is i, I think there's no question of you know it's a very sort of sl- slickly made movie and very sort of impactful and effective in many many ways but i think i do have to concede that all of the criticisms that are levied against the film are legitimate. Mm-hmm. You know, it is excessively violent. You know, do should you know should we be confronted with the the, the truth of the violence of his execution? Um, sure, but it is a movie, and you do want yeah. people to to watch it and sit through it, and you do want you know families to gather and you know. Uh, you know, learn some for some learn this story for the first time. You know, he wants this to be a. A, a, a um prominent text if you like you know mm-hmm. and and the definitive uh version of this story so you know you can ease off a little bit there is a way of suggesting mm-hmm. stuff without um without ru- literally rubbing it in your face uh you know does he lean into the anti-semitism as as we've as we've discussed um i i, I feel that he does somewhat unnecessarily yeah, yeah. Um, and is it sort of weird and almost supernatural in some of its more outlandish imagery? Uh, you know, adding an air of almost fantasy to a story mm-hmm. that, again, you're trying to simultaneously ground in reality and say, no, this is the truth of what it really was. And here, it, here is magic, you know, Yeah, yeah. at the yeah. same time. Uh, so all of those things I have to agree with. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, I have a bigger problem with the throwaway scene in which Jesus invents a table. Yeah. <laughs> than I than I do with um with with some of those other criticisms. Really, you have a problem with the the throwaway scene where he invents the table. I think it's just stupid. I I think it adds mm. nothing to the story, and it's such an odd thing for him to in his role as a carpenter growing up. Um. Yeah. It's, it's see, a really I, odd I like, way of, repre- of representing it. I like that celebration of the mundane, that at the end of the day, this was a humble carpenter from a know-nothing town that no one had really ever heard of until he died. And for me, it seems like that, which it provides the grounding that I think you, you were talking about. That's the way I interpreted it. As far as the fantastical elements, definitely. I mean, about 75% of this 80% of this is gospel. I know my scriptures well enough. I know the lines, you know, a lot of this is lifted right from the gospels and inserted. Um, those fantastical elements, I thought he did too much of it. Let, let's face it, at the end of the day, 
we, at least as far as Christians, we are celebrating somebody who rose from the dead. So there is a spectacular, fantastical element already written into the narrative. And so to kind of accentuate that there is a spiritual dynamic at work and is interacting with the physical, I don't have a huge problem with. I thought he leaned into it too much. Um, and I would say that about all three elements you you raise. I don't have a huge problem with the the violence because I want an authentic experience that I've never had before. Yet there's times when I was rewatching it last night where I thought, ooh, I, I think that was just done for gratuitous, you know, that was just gratuitous without any real grounding. The anti-Semitic issues, again, I don't have a problem with Jews being the bad guys because they can be bad guys like anybody can be bad guys there's there's good jews in this movie and there's bad jews in this movie and it's just the way the narrative plays out but knowing a little more about mel gibson over the years and re-watching it, i think oh maybe there's a little bit leaning into that more than just a uh a, you know an unbiased view and then finally the fantastical elements i just felt it was I don't mind them being inserted to a certain, I mean, there's, it, it's a movie and there's some liberties that are going to be taken. And I think the spiritual dynamic, th th there needs to be a spiritual dynamic on display. But again, in hindsight, looking back at it, do we really need Satan with a midget child, hairy midget child walking around? It, it's obviously Gibson just having some fun. And so, yeah, it's not perfect by any stretch. But at the end of the day, this is a strong film, I, I still feel, 20 years later. Well, that's going to end our little Easter special on The Passion of the Christ. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on this? Obviously, it's a controversial film. James and I highlighted three areas that we think maybe Gibson took some liberties that he didn't need to, but do you feel the same? James, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, and what are your other versions, retellings of this story? You know, where do you think uh, this has been told better? on screen, big screen or small screen. Uh, let us know your your favorite Easter movies uh, in the comments below. Hey, and if you celebrate Easter, have a happy Easter. And if you don't, have a good Sunday. You're wonderful to see. You ought to be in pictures. Oh, what a hit you would be.